We're going to stifle Russia's ability and its economy to grow for years to come. Which I think would be a tall order. Yes, it's not easy. And I expect a series of deliberate, methodical hikes as the year continues. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. A time to shrink. The Fed lays out plans to reduce its balance sheet by over $1 trillion a year. The U.S. slaps new penalties on two of Russia's biggest banks and uh, on Putin's daughters. Italy says they would support a ban on gas imports if the EU is united behind it. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we have an exclusive conversation with the chief executive of Britain's Financial Conduct Authority, Nikhil Rati, sending your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets and definitely markets uh, taking in their stride after a huge sell-off yesterday about the plan to reduce the balance sheet from uh, the Fed. So there was a sell-off yesterday sparked by, of course, a more hawkish Federal Reserve Bank. Global equity markets dived after these minutes showed that officials were focusing on tamping down inflation expectations and really outlined a plan to pair some of the balance sheet by more than $1 trillion a year. The mood today is quite different. European stocks still being supported two-tenths of a percent higher. We don't know how it plays out because they actually started eight-tenths of a percent higher. So they're losing a bit of momentum, but it'll be interesting to see what kind of analysis on whether, for example, some of the hawkish message is even more hawkish than currently priced in. The other story, of course, is ruble 81.0625. Incredible how the Central Bank of Russia has managed to engineer the ruble so that it didn't collapse, as we saw at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. The FTSE down some four-tenths of 8 percent, but if you look at the FTSE MIB in Italy and the CAC 40 uh, supported, for example, the CAC 40 gaining two-tenths of 8 percent. Now, the Fed signaled that it'll shrink its bond holdings by as much as $95 billion a month. Now, this comes as minutes from March's meeting showed many officials would have opted for a 50 basis points hike, but actually held off because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, Fed leaders have been signaling for some time that they are prepared to act more hawkishly. My colleagues and I may well reach the conclusion that we'll need to move more quickly. Faster is better. An extremely aggressive rate path is appropriate today. If it's appropriate to raise uh, interest rates by 50 basis points at, at a meeting, then then I, I would think that would, we should do that. 50 basis points is going to be an option that we'll have to consider. Maybe a 50 helps. Um, you know, I'm, I'm open-minded about that. 50 basis point moves would definitely be in the mix. If we need to do 50, 50 is what we'll do. I don't think 50 basis points should be off the table. It could be 25, it could be 50, it could be 75, it could be one. I have everything on the table right now. A series of deliberate, methodical hikes. And by starting to reduce the balance sheet at a rapid pace as soon as our May meeting. The economy is very strong and well positioned to withstand tighter monetary policy. Well, I also have everything on the table. We're joined by Rebecca Chesworth, senior equity strategist at State Street. Rebecca, do you have everything on the table? I mean, we now have more of a plan. What does it mean for equities? Yes, it's great. I love those clips. I, I guess we, we get it. It's going to be 50 basis okay. points. And certainly, if you're looking at the OIS pricing in the market today, uh, we're there. We know what we're going to see next month. What does it do for equities? Well, in a way, we've moved beyond the data point, so it gives you a little bit more um, certainty in the markets. And I think it leaves the markets ready to move on to thinking about earnings, to so thinking more about those fundamentals, how the companies are yeah. uh, surviving at the moment, how companies are responding to this high inflation, um, what they're thinking about rates. So I think that the market's focus moves on from today. So, Rebecca, how do you hedge against inflation? So I think one way of doing it is to be incredibly selective. One thing that we said last year throughout the year was to buy energy stocks, and that really is a call that we're continuing this year. So we're now into our second quarter. We still think that energy is that best way to play inflation. With or without a war, we see these crude oil prices staying high and the energy companies being able to pass that on. If it's not energy, then you either need to think about something else cyclical that has the pricing power, and maybe you can see some of that within industrials, or you go much more defensive like healthcare. We're seeing a movement, of course, in real rates, Rebecca. What does that mean for some of the valuations that are a little bit on the toppy side? 
Well, it means that we have to stay very vigilant still. So the market is down so far this year, you know, and it, but it has recovered somewhat. And therefore, valuations remain extremely high. There are parts of the market, such as uh, technology, that remain very reliant on what's happening with rates and with valuations. So I still think that there are parts of the market that we need to uh, pay attention to. And as you say, real rates coming back towards uh, neutral and then positive will have an impact there. Okay, Rebecca, I want to come back to energy and, of course, you know, the idea that if you look at the commodity complex, then you could also have demand destruction and what that means for the broader markets. Now, let's get also, Rebecca, the latest on the war in Ukraine. The country's foreign minister has pleaded for more weapons at a meeting of NATO allies in Brussels. My agenda is very simple. It has only three items on it. It's weapons, weapons and weapons. We are confident that the best way to help Ukraine now is to provide it with all necessary to contain Putin and to defeat Russian army in Ukraine, in the territory of Ukraine. Well, our Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo joins us now from NATO headquarters. So, Maria, NATO Secretary General warning that we're entering a crucial phase in the war. How will NATO respond? Yes, Francine, and the Secretary General was very clear this morning. He says this break uh, that we've seen from the Russian army at this point essentially is about regrouping and rearming and then focused on the east. He says that Russia could be aiming to take full control of the Donbass. A lot of this, Francine, of course, because the clock in many ways is ticking for Vladimir Putin. There is a parade coming up, Victory Day, May uh, 9th. This is the biggest celebration of the end of the Second World War, that Soviet uh, victory over Nazi Germany. For Vladimir Putin, he needs to be able to show his public something. When it comes to NATO ministers today, they continue to say they don't want to escalate, they don't want this war to spill over from Ukraine, but support the country. But you heard it from the Ukrainian foreign minister very clearly. Okay, that is great, but at this point, what we need is weapons, weapons, weapons. All right, Maria, thanks so much. Of course, I'm Maria Tadeo there at NATO headquarters following that, very, that meeting very, very closely. We're back with Rebecca Chesworth, senior equity strategist at State Street. Rebecca, I wanted to go back to this idea that actually if there's a recession looming and it's extremely difficult, of course, in Europe to see a way out of it, then what that means for demand destruction for, for example, the energy complex, oil, but also others. And so what would support your, you know, your attractiveness to some of the sectors? So I think you therefore you become more vigilant, more selective, because of course uh, some areas will slow down more than others. I would uh, suggest that you need to be particularly um, careful about the consumer areas at the moment. So areas such as consumer spending, because uh, as well as the economic slowdown, you of course are seeing consumer balance sheets squeezed. Uh, so this was an area that we liked earlier this year, but I think that's off the table for now. So that's one area to be uh, wary of. Of course, you will see some demand destruction, but for where we are now, you're still going to see commodity prices remain high because of that supply dislocation, because of the supply chain problems. So even though you may see demand fall somewhat, you've still got those supply problems at keeping uh, that imbalance going. So, and that goes for not just oil and gas, but it also goes for some of your metal areas as well. So there is a sense that we see people looking yeah. at the metals and the miners, some of the other material stocks. And then with industrials, maybe there is a segue to um, think about areas which are seeing demand growth. It's not nice, yeah. but we could see increased demand for defence spending out there, for example. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, when you look at some of the reshoring or some of the supply chain efficiency, I know they've been tested by the Trump presidency, by COVID, and now the war. How much of these supply chains are still left to change and retrace? Oh, significantly. I mean, we've been living through uh, globalization. It's, it's a 20, 30 year phenomenon. Not to say that that all unravels, but you have had a significant move offshore and therefore even if you only bring part of your supply chain the part that's nearest to you the part that's most vital back then that is quite a significant move for a lot of countries and companies and industries will maybe see it start with phones with cars with some of their vital components coming back towards the uk and towards europe is there anything left though rebecca in europe that seems attractive at the moment given all the headwinds and the proximity to ukraine and russia 
very difficult. I'd suggest something like healthcare, which is a defensive area. We know investors are very underweight there, but we know also that institutional investors have been buying. The, the, the uh, lack of support for that sector has always been because of the political risk in the US. But now maybe the administration there has got much more important things on the table, and we, f we fail to see that move to um, restrict the pharmaceutical pricing. So that could be an interesting area. All right, Rebecca, thanks so much. Rebecca Chesworth there, senior equity strategist at State Street, joining us this morning. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we also have an exclusive conversation with the chief executive of Britain's Financial Conduct Authority, Nikhil Rati. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV. Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Mira GTX is a clinical state gene therapy company that develops potentially curative treatments for patients living with serious diseases. Listed on the NASDAQ, Mira GTX is focused on diseases of the eye, salivary gland, and central nervous system. The chief executive, Andy Forbes, joined the company in 2015 with a background as a healthcare or healthcare hedge fund manager. So, Zandi, thank you so much for joining us. This is an interesting conversation, of course, on some of you know what's at the forefront in terms of technologies. What do you need right now? I don't know whether it's regulatory. I know there are a number of trials at the moment or whether it's just the price of some of the technology to come down to, to you know to have this more widely available and good morning good morning <laughs> thank you for having me um, very interesting question and, and a multi-layered question because um, gene therapy is a completely new modality yeah. of treatment yeah. where you use the gene the message mm -hmm. to instruct the body what to make which is then your therapy so um, Early gene therapies uh, often used very large doses mm -hmm. and it was very expensive to make them. And one of the things we did when we first started the company to address this manufacturing cost is bring manufacturing in-house. Mm -hmm. So we have a manufacturing facility here in London, yeah. actually. And, um, and in addition to that, over the last two years, we've all experienced supply chain issues yeah. and we've recognized the importance for both cost and timing right. of bringing upstream supply in-house, which we've yeah. done, as well as downstream analytics. And that really addresses the cost of the therapy itself, right. how you make it. Um, and so, Zandi, when you look at COVID and actually what we've lived through in the last two years, we've thought a lot more about our health. And I don't know whether it, it, may, you know, it means that governments, but also private individuals, are looking at some of the therapy differently now because we're expecting new social contracts, or whether actually it means that the focus is on the vaccines and, and on nothing else. So I think um, what we saw in COVID is the healthcare system galvanized using new technology that was available because of the investment in biotech and all these new therapies like gene therapy and be able to come to the rescue of the world with vaccines and new mm -hmm. treatments. And I don't think that vaccines are, while really useful and have been incredibly helpful in this epidemic, they treat or prevent infectious diseases. And we're finding and seeing today, post-COVID or, or just post-COVID, that the world has many large diseases which we still don't have treatments for, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, certain types of cancer. And so there is a huge amount of innovation mm -hmm. in healthcare. Gene therapy is one of those yeah. new modalities that can now be used to address some of those other large ap academic, well, epidemics. <laughs> well, so when do you think gene therapy will really kind of take off? And again, it's one that you laid out, you know, very, very you know, consistently in terms of it, it, it has to be part of the money, the technology and things like that. But how far away are we from that in terms of years? So there are different gene therapies, and we're very close, in fact, to having gene therapies that really make a difference in certain diseases, such as inherited diseases. Yeah. And uh, two products are now approved, which are gene therapies. And we, with our partner, Johnson & Johnson, have a late-stage clinical trial in inherited blindness. 
um, which should be approved, approved if that trial is successful in the coming years. So it's not uh, decades right. away. However, one of the things we've done at Mira is develop even newer technology to harness gene therapy right. in a way that we can use it for diabetes, for brain cancer, and that's probably four or five years right. beyond the use of yeah. gene therapy for inherited diseases. And is that, I mean, when you speak to investors, is there a, a part of the world where they're, they're more behind this? And again, I don't know whether it's cultural or, or just because the information is of, of easier access and understanding to them. Uh, investors are, in biotech in general, mm -hmm. very, very sophisticated in the US. Our headquarters in, are in the US. I was an investor in New York. And, um, and there is a really sophisticated healthcare and biotech investment ecosystem there that exists in other places, but not as broadly and strongly as in the US. Zandi, thank you so much for coming on today. Zandi Forbes there, the chief executive of Mira GTX. Now, smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we have an exclusive interview with the chief executive of Britain's Financial Conduct Authority, Nikhil Rati, sending your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition and Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Emmanuel Macron is spending the final week before France's presidential election this Sunday trying to connect with voters through campaign stops and media appearances as polls show the gap between him and far-right leader Marine Le Pen narrowing. Now, the latest surveys show Macron would beat Le Pen by 53 to 47 percent in a runoff on April 24th. Here's what Marine Le Pen had to say about two of her, of her political adversaries. They are exactly the same. Valérie Pécresse had been considered at some point to become Macron's prime minister. She could have been without difficulty. They have the same political DNA. They think the same about Europe, the economy, free trade. They think the same about everything. They are both globalists. I am national. These are two different views. You have to accept that. It's really the choice that the French will have to decide between the national and the global. So Valérie Pécresse or Emmanuel Macron, it's the same. Well, joining us now is our reporter in Paris, Caroline Conan. So, Caroline, first of all, what's changed in the campaign? And the polls from Monday got so much tighter. What's happened? The race has been tightening over the past few days. Uh, initially, you know, Emmanuel Macron benefited from uh, this uh, rally around the flag effect after the beginning of the war in Ukraine. He appeared as a statesman above the political uh, bickering. But then uh, you had another effect uh, of the war in Ukraine. I mean, first, initially, uh, the far right uh, candidates Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour were both considered as pro Russia, at least sympathetic towards uh, Vladimir. Vladimir Putin, but technically Eric Zemmour actually took all the blame for his proximity uh, with uh, Russia. He said in the past, for example, that he was dreaming of a French Putin. So the French voters, uh, surprisingly, almost forgot about what uh, Marine Le Pen uh, said about Russia uh, and uh, her proximity with Vladimir Putin uh, in the past. And the second effect was, of course, inflation. The war in Ukraine has fueled energy inflation, food inflation, and uh, Marine Le Pen has put the issue of spending power and the cost of living at the heart of her campaign, and that is paying off in the polls. Yeah, it's really amazing, Gary, when you look at, you know, the number of candidates, some of these candidates that we thought at the time could do quite well, and actually how they're polling now. So what exactly is the appeal of Marine Le Pen. I was reminded by Valerie that, of course, you know, last time there was a presidential election, it was all about exiting the EU. Now she's trying to rebrand herself, but of course there's a border plan, and so what makes her, you know, more attractive? Is it just the cost of living? 
So technically, yes, she has uh, no plans, at least on paper, to leave the EU or the euro anymore because she knows that is exactly why she lost back in 2017, five years ago. So no plans like that because she knows that's not popular. But what she proposes, for example, is to cut VAT taxes on fuel, gas, electricity prices from 20 percent to 5 percent. So technically, with the current energy inflation we're seeing, this is appealing to many voters. Other proposals include lowering uh, income uh, taxes for younger people, people under 30. She also wants to encourage employers to give a 10 percent pay rise to everyone, especially the lowest incomes, by cutting all the payroll taxes for those pay rises. So all these measures to support uh, the disposable income of the French, support the working class, support the blue-collar electorate uh, is giving her a boost in the polls and, and uh, causing this gap to narrow between her and Le Pen and Macron. Caroline, thanks so much. Caroline Cunard there, our reporter in Paris. Don't miss our special coverage. Also, the first round of the presidential election starting tomorrow will be live in Paris, of course, for the whole show. And then as polls close on Sunday, 7 p.m. UK time, 8 p.m. Paris time, will also be live. Smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. To shrink, the Fed lays out plans to reduce its balance sheet by over $1 trillion a year. The U.S. also slaps new penalties on two of Russia's biggest banks and on Putin's daughters. Italy says it would support a ban on gas imports if the EU is united behind it. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we have an exclusive conversation with the chief executive of Britain's Financial Conduct Authority, Nikhil Rati, sending your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. So, as promised, our interview this morning, the UK's financial regulator, has just published a three-year strategy and annual business plan. It hopes that it will see that will see the body move faster to protect consumers from financial harm and create targets to oversee the UK's financial markets more assertively and efficiently. Well, we're delighted now to be joined by the UK's Financial Conduct Authority Chief Executive Officer Nihal Ratti. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you've also singled out um, some of the social media platforms on some of the immediate action that they can take. So we'll get to that in a second. But you joined as head in 2020. I mean, this is the middle of the pandemic. You've had to live with Ukraine, with COVID, and of course, some of the other things. What's been hardest? Well, good morning, Francine. You're right. It's been a very, very eventful 18 months um, in the seat um, as CEO. We've delivered um, some big changes coming out of the pandemic, a billion pounds of compensation for small businesses, um, major changes in the insurance market uh, for uh, consumers, and now dealing with a tragic situation uh, in Ukraine as well, supporting the multilateral uh, effort there. Uh, this morning, uh, we're setting out our three-year yep. strategy. Um, we are focusing on three things, uh, reducing harm, uh, yep. setting new standards, particularly for consumer protection, and promoting competition and positive change. And the key thing for us is targeting some of the firms that are not meeting basic standards. So we're hiring right. 80 new people on yep. top of 200 that have joined so far this year to really make sure we sort out standards, also to support those firms that are delivering uh, for consumers. So the idea to, to focus on these three cores is actually, I guess, you measure it so you know, correctly because the metrics are easier to, to, I guess, measure and, and you know, because you've laid it out more clearly, but also act faster. Absolutely. So today we're setting out the next step um, in our transformation. It's always hard as a regulator um, to set out metrics, but we're having a go um, this morning so that um, we can be judged and we can be accountable for uh, our delivery. Mm -hmm. And we have taken steps to change our governance so that our decisions, particularly against firms that are not meeting standards, can be taken faster. Um, and that then reduces the regulatory cost um, for the best firms in the market as well. How much faster? I know it's a difficult question because it all depends on, on a case by case. But how fast do you need to be to be more efficient? Well, we need to be efficient at the gateway. So, for example, um, we've hired 95 new colleagues there over the last year. Um, one in 13 firms um, uh, used to uh, make it through uh, the uh, gateway. Now it's one in um, so one in seven firms used to make okay. it through the gateway. Now it's one in 13. So we've tightened that up quite considerably. Okay. Um, and uh, we are also uh, taking action, as you mentioned earlier, um, with respect to social media, where we're seeing scams um, really um, escalate, particularly during the, the pandemic. We've been pleased to see Google 
um, adjust their policies so that financial promotions in the UK on Google can only be provided by firms that are authorised by the FCA. And this morning we've pressed Meta and Twitter also um, to give us clear timetables for action. And Nicole, th these are scams in what space? So is it the crypto space or is it really just broad ranging? It's broad ranging, a whole range of uh, financial scams, whether it's crypto, payments fraud, high risk investments. Um, firms uh, are subject to um, standards for financial promotions. We want to make sure everyone's meeting uh, those standards. We're particularly concerned that vulnerable consumers can go online um, and can get duped very quickly out of very substantial portions of their life savings. How, how difficult is it to hire the right people, to finding them and actually the, then attracting them to the organization? Well, we're really pleased to have had 200 colleagues joining so far this year. We're expanding nationally as well, recruiting in Leeds uh, and Edinburgh. And we're bringing in more diversity of skills, in particular um, in data uh, and uh, technology. There's been a buoyant labour market in the UK, um, but we're confident that, that we can deliver against the targets we've set out. I mean, technology is extremely difficult because there's, of course, a danger that you know, some of these are so sophisticated. By the time you see what's going on and regulate them, you're too late to the game. So how much is this one of the most difficult parts that you need to deal with right now? Absolutely. We need to be ready to move fast and in a more agile way. So we've, we're bringing in more technological expertise. We've also been a world leader, I would say, in mm -hmm. supporting fintech innovation. Um, we have a sandbox which has been um, emulated by a number of our colleague regulators around the world to enable fintech firms to pilot um, their ideas. We've taken steps to improve our listings regime mm -hmm. uh, so that technology firms can raise capital more easily in the United Kingdom. And we're launching this year what we're calling a scale box so firms can grow faster um, and meet regulatory obligations at the same time. So innovation is absolutely yeah. central to um, the future vision for the FCA. Nicole, when you look at, of course, the sanctions in Ukraine, how are you, you know, keeping up with that? Is there an area of concern of, of how some of these things are either you know, being put around or how they're being used? a very fast moving situation and we are working very closely with governments um, and our partners around the world to make sure that the financial market is able to adjust to these sanctions and that some of the technical issues that arise um, are identified and dealt with quickly. We're now uh, pulling together some special teams to monitor compliance uh, with the sanctions across all domains, whether that's in the banking sector, asset management, insurance sector, but also in areas such as crypto, um, where we have to make sure that there are no new avenues for evading um, the rules that are being put in place. Have you seen that so far at all? So I guess Russian, you know, Russian wealth and e-money, and actually how much of concern is that? There has been speculation um, that, that that has been happening, and we're watching that um, very closely. What's really important, I think, is that um, leaders of these firms, wherever they um, may sit, um, are cooperative um, with the effort here um, to make sure that um, the sanctions are effective um, and uh, have the intended outcome. And have uh, most firms that you've you know, reached out to, have they been cooperative with the FCA? Absolutely. I think firms have responded very quickly. Um, I'm also very proud of the team at the FCA um, who've uh, worked incredibly hard to, to get these systems in place and everyone is trying their hardest I think um, to uh, make these as effective um, as can be in what is a very fast moving um, and difficult and sad situation. Nicola Ratti, thank you so much for joining us today. That was the chief executive there of the UK's Financial Conduct Authority joining us for an exclusive conversation this morning. Now coming up, battle of the boardroom, the power struggle between Italy's largest insurer, richest man and most prominent investment banker continues. We'll discuss what's going on at Generali next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the power struggle between billionaire bankers at Italy's largest insurer, Generali, continues, and it's not dull. On the one side, Italy's top-ranked billionaire, Leonardo Del Vecchio, and businessman, Francesco Gaetano Caltagirone, who together amass a 15% stake in Generali. The pair maintain that Generali has fallen behind in asset management and seek to oust the chairman and chief executive. Now, they have promised higher earnings growth, sweeping cuts, and more deals. Opposing them is Italy's most powerful investment banker, the chief executive of Mediobanca, Alberto Nagel, who holds a 17% stake in Generali and stands behind the incumbent chief executive, Philippe Donnet. Well, we're now joined by ex Goldman Sachs banker and chairman of Milan based investment banking boutique, CC and Sochi, Claudio Costamagna, who Celta Girone and Del Vecchio would like to see taking over the role of chairman at Generali. So I hope that's clear. It's certainly clear to us, but I've been also following the story very closely. Claudio, thank you so much uh, for joining us.
Yes, I mean, this is a battle like we haven't seen or we've rarely seen in Italy. First of all, you're here talking to investors yeah. because they want them on your side. How's yeah. that going? Uh, well, no, I think it's going well. I mean, first of all, it's not the first time that this thing happens in Italy. In fact, I was involved in the first ever proxy fight on the Milan Stock Exchange, which was back in 2012 with Impregilo. Yeah. Where also we went against the incumbent uh, shareholder, which was backed by Mediobanca, and we won, and we changed completely the profile. Yeah, of the this company. feels big also because they hold so much of the Italian bonds. So it feels like it's it's a systemic institution. Almost. Yeah, no, generally it's much bigger, of course, right. and and uh, it's, it's strategic assets in Italy. That's clear. Um, I think that the reason why Mr. Cattagirone decided to do this is because. If you look at the last 20 years, there's been a steady decline of Generali vis-à-vis -vis its peers. Uh, its peers are Allianz, AXA, and Zurich mainly. And if we take the combined market cap of those four insurers, back in 2005, Generali represented 28%. Now it is 14%, so half of it. Yeah. So clearly there's been a steady decline uh, of the company. That you say is not necessarily linked to Italian politics or the no, Italian no, discount? No, no, no. It, it's, it's, a, it's a variety of reasons, I think. Uh, one is also the reason that Medibank has sort of always kept a grip on, uh, on, on this, but it's not the only reason. Uh, there's been issues that have never been tackled, really. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we decided to uh, go with Luciano Cirina, who's been yeah. there for 33 years, who's worked at Generali, who runs, or used to run, because yeah. now he's been... Uh, uh, ousted. Uh, ousted. But he used to uh, run the most profitable region of Generali. Yeah. Uh, in order to start tackling those issues yeah. uh, and, and really try to rebound it and make the gap that yeah. in these last 20 years has been created with the, the, the peers. Claudio, you, you have supporters and you have critics. The critics say, look, you want to cut costs, but where? Actually, the plan's no, not uh, detailed uh, enough. I think cutting costs and is one. And you want M&A, which is hard to do. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, cutting costs is one of the things, yeah. um, and it's not the most important. I think the most important one is invest in technology and data analytics, yeah. which they underinvested up to now. Uh, there's not been any convergence of the systems uh, around the various countries. Um, and that's the most important thing that we need to tackle because the world is changing at an incredibly fast pace and we need to keep up with that. And investment in technology is the first thing. Uh, the second thing is to uh, review the geographic footprint. 85% mm -hmm. um, of the profits come from four regions and we are in 20 countries. Uh, you know, why? Uh, it's managerial complexity and we need to simplify that. Mm -hmm. Simplify and then do M&A. M&A is the cherry on the cake. Okay. okay? Uh, so there's a lot of talk about M&A yeah, in, in but the other emerging it's, markets. It's still the cherry, the, cherry, the cherry on the cake. I mean, first we need to have the cake fixed. And then you can put the cherry, if you find the right cherry, of course. And I think that if we find the right cherry in terms of it, is, it fits our strategy, uh, and especially on the asset management side, which is another area where Generali yeah. is lacking its peers, there I think we should, uh, we should do something. How many investors are behind you? Do you actually think you can win? Oh, we actually think we can win, absolutely. Uh, you said in the, in, at the beginning that Mediobank has 17%. In fact, Mediobank has 12.5% or 13%. The, re, the 4% it was a blonde moment, yeah. is, uh, is a stock that they borrowed yeah. in order to okay, vote yeah. for, the, for the shareholders meeting, yeah. which is something which is you know, a dubious practice because yeah. it is forbidden, for instance, that by ISLA, which is the International Securities uh, Lending yeah. Association, of which Mediobanca is a part yeah. of. Which yeah, but says I think, so the reg I mean, on the regulatory side, so they have 17% in voting rights, but Claudio, how many investors have said that they will support you and actually go, uh, go against we, the We cannot numbers? say the, 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 the number, number yeah. but it is substantial. Do you it's worry substantial that and there is a, a large retail portion, which yeah. nobody talks about it. You know, the institutional side is relatively yeah. small compared to the size of Generali. Also because Generali in the last 20 years has been mainly a macro play on interest rate and on Italy. It right. doesn't mean an equity story. But Claudio, I mean retail, so this is what small investors, do you need to like knock on doors? And well, do they yeah, care? Absolutely. If they have a steady return, uh, do uh, they well, want to do But there are two kinds of better? retails. Yeah. There are two there is the, the retail, which is really retail, I mean, you know, 10,000, 20,000 euros. But then there, are, there is a retail of large families. Yeah. And generally has always been, you know, a sort of secure investments. You know, they always pay the good right. dividends. And, uh, and so there are a lot of families which yeah. we are knocking at the door, absolutely. The current chief executive, generally, I think, said that the dividend is, is you know, is at risk no, with your plan. It is absolutely not a risk. In fact, I think in our plan we're going to generate more cash. Than what this is the, a, a the promise. Plan. Is this a commitment? Absolutely, and we said that we're going to keep the dividend the same yeah. as the plan of, of the current management. 
But we say even something more, that if we cannot find the famous cherry on the cake, <laughs> we're going to have excess cash. And that yeah. excess cash, we can easily distribute. How big is a cherry, us. though? Is it like a it basket depends. of cherries? I mean, <laughs> we don't know. I mean, you know, m and you need to be two to dance, right? And <laughs> we don't know yet. Okay. But uh, you, see, you see real opportunities out there. I think don't there's going to be opportunities. But, you know, we have to get the right one, and which is exactly ancillary to our yeah. strategy. If it's not ancillary to a strategy, we're not going to do it. Um, Claude, do you worry that actually this is a lose-lose situation because whoever wins will have a board that splits? And if you're a retail investor, I mean, it feels messy. No, I think I think if we win, there's not going to be any change because you know at the end of the day, Mediobank, uh, it's in Mediobank's interest to create value as well because they are the largest shareholder. So if we create value for all shareholders, we're going to create value for Mediobank as well. Yeah. So, so you don't think there's foreign investors in saying you know g generally right now is, is something that I don't want to touch because I'm not sure exactly how. It falls and it, it just feels it, also it, it quite. It might be, personal. but that's exactly what I think we should do. If we get elected, we're yeah. going to have to do a lot of work to try to in, in, uh, convince institutional, long institutional investors, not passive investors, yeah. to invest in generally because the potential is absolutely there to really do a great job. So uh, I know you've also recall it what the the because there's of course the, the lion. So this is the, the regenerating like the roaring lion. Right? Absolutely. That's how you call awakening, your plan. Awakening, the awakening the lion. lion. <laughs> there you go. I couldn't find the words. Who's your your who do you think your biggest rival that you could mimic is in in then in this insurance space? Well, you know, the, those three guys, Allianz, Axa and Zurich are the three peers and uh, we need to see to look at what they've done, but you know, generally it's its own history, its own yeah. DNA. And we need to work on that to make it better, not just look at the others. But clearly, those three are our three main competitors. Gold standard. Claudio, thank you so much for joining us. Claudio Castellagna, they are the chairman of the Milan based investment banking boutique CC and Sochi. And of course, we have also reached out to Generali, and we'll see whether we can get the leadership of that company on air as well. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The U.S. has announced new sanctions targeting President Putin's adult daughters, along with two of Russia's biggest banks. The Times newspaper, meanwhile, reports the UK is drawing up plans to send armoured vehicles to Ukraine, as well as anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles. Italy said it would support an EU-wide ban on Russian gas if the bloc was united behind that idea. Now the Fed has laid out a long-awaited plan to shrink its balance sheet by more than a trillion dollars a year. Minutes from its March meeting also show many officials would have preferred a 50 basis points hike, but held off because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The maximum runoff total of $95 billion a month has almost doubled the peak rate the last time the Fed trimmed its balance sheet in the period from 2017. Now, the UK is ramping up plans to build new nuclear power stations and offshore wind farms as it seeks to shore up energy supply in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The government's energy security strategy targets a tripling of installed nuclear power capacity by 2050. It also adds more ambitious targets on hydrogen, solar power and North Sea oil and gas projects. And New York City has seen major crime rise by more than 36% percent in March from a year ago. Police say citywide shooting incidents increased by 16 percent, robberies by 48 percent and burglaries by 40 percent through though homicides did fall. Mayor Eric Adams who started his campaign on public safety has focused the first months of his minority on fighting the city's rising crime levels. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrins. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, Bridgewater wins big while some others suffer from brutal reverses. Hedge funds in focus. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne.
Good morning, Francine. Global infrastructure partners and Brookfield Asset Management say they have made a non-binding bid for Italian infrastructure company Atlantia. This comes after Bloomberg's report that Blackstone is said to be exploring a bid for Atlantia, raising the prospect of a bidding war with a Spanish construction tycoon Perez. Now, HP shares surged as much as 10% as a filing showed Berkshire Hathaway bought a stake in the laptop maker valued at more than $4.2 billion. Warren Buffett's company had historically shied away from tech investments, but has leaned into the sector in recent years with a stake in Apple. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now let's focus on the hedge fund industry and Ray Dalio's Bridgewater posted a 16.3% return in the first quarter, while Glenview Capital's flagship hedge fund rose 5.9%. Tiger Cobb suffered a brutal reversal amid 2022's market turmoil, losing money on their favorite trades of tech giants and unicorns. Well, joining us now is our Bloomberg senior reporter covering hedge funds. He knows it all in hedge funds, and he's Nishant Kumar. Nishant, thank you so much for joining us. And before we look at the winners and losers, I mean, you sat down and you kind of said, wow, what a crazy quarter. So who won and who lost? Yes, I mean, it was a sensational quarter for hedge funds. Uh, whatever they required to make money uh, was there uh, if their bets were on, on the right side uh, of the volatility that we saw uh, during the first quarter. So the leader of the pack is a macro hedge fund run from New York, uh, Hather Jupiter Fund. That fund was up 148 percent. You know, that's sensational. He has broken his own record of biggest month twice so far this year. And he's having a dream run, his best year so far. Uh, and, and primarily, we don't exactly know his trades, but it seems what contributed to his massive returns is rates trading and, and commodities. Of course, yeah. commodities benefited hugely and helped a lot of macro funds yeah. uh, uh, last quarter because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. So, Nishan, that's a clearly a winning bet. What were some of the losing ones? And again, volatility, it just depends on how you trade it. So uh, what are we expecting going forward? So it seems the volatility is here to remain. Um, commodity prices are, uh, are going up or, or volatile. Central banks are ending uh, their quantitative easing, uh, which has troubled, which had troubled a lot of hedge funds uh, over the last many, many years. Interest rates are, are, are going up. So all these are really fertile hunting ground for hedge funds if they are on the right side uh, uh, of the trade, obviously. The things that did not work out very well for um, some hedge funds, and you mentioned Tiger Cubs, was yeah. You know, these these funds had gained massively because of their bets on technology and, and growth stocks and some of the unlisted names as well, unicorns. All those, you know, pockets of the market suffered yeah. massively uh, uh, last quarter. And that led to some really significant losses as much as a, uh -huh. uh, one third of their um, assets uh, last uh, quarter. Nisha. Thank you so much, Nishan Kumar there, our star reporter and hedge funds with a great story looking at Bridgewater, Rokos, and of course some of the others as well. The markets, they're still on the up, not as much as they were before, but certainly markets showing signs of a recovery. Uh, traders stepping in after a sell-off sparked by hawkish minutes from the Federal Reserve. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kay Lines in New York. Our guy Johnson is here in London. This is Bloomberg. This is not quite duck and cover territory. It's all about QT. That's what's driving things. This is a Fed that's trying to use its policy tools, both rate hikes and the balance sheet. They'll go for a soft landing, but their chances of pulling off are very, very low. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Thursday, April the 7th. Our top stories today. The Fed's minutes signal an aggressive unwind of its $9 trillion balance sheets and point to a half-point hike at next month's meeting. 
Ukraine pleads for NATO to send more weapons ahead of an expected Russian offensive. It's also accusing Germany of dragging its feet. We're going to be live at NATO headquarters in Brussels with the latest. And Warren Buffett certainly has his appetite back. Berkshire Hathaway confirming overnight that it's bought a $4.2 billion stake in HP. The laptop and printer maker stock up sharply pre-market. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. Kayleigh, overnight. Asian equities taking a bit of a hit. Yeah, catching up or rather maybe catching down to the losses we saw in the U.S. and Europe yesterday. Pretty much down across the board when it comes to the regional benchmarks. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole fell more than 1%, actually more like 1.4%. One individual stock story I wanted to point to, though, is JD.com. The company's founder and CEO, Richard Liu, stepping down from that CEO role, really joining a long list of big Chinese tech tycoons who have had to exit top managing uh, management roles due to Beijing's lockdown on uh, that sector, crackdown really uh, from a regulation standpoint. So JD.com was down about 3.2% uh, overnight. In other asset classes, I also wanted to point to the cooling we are seeing in the selling pressure in the global bond market. That was true too in Australia. You had yields coming down, therefore price going up, down about four basis points on that five-year yield, the belly of the curve, right around 2.5%. 7.45%. And then I also wanted to point out in the commodity complex, iron ore lower for a third day in Singapore, down about 3%. The issue there, Matt, is China. Rising COVID cases, lockdowns resulting, that creates a huge demand question, not just for iron ore, but really commodities across the board. Yeah, and really interesting to look at commodities as well as investors boost um, their exposure to the sector, to the asset class. Take a look at what's going on here. We have kind of a risk on picture. S&P futures are up. Of course, we We've seen drops in the cash trade for the last couple of sessions of 1% or more. The U.S. 10-year yield right now coming down as investors buy that. So um, it does uh, show at one, uh, sorry, 256.78 lower yields, maybe better for tech stocks, although they haven't reacted too poorly um, over the last couple of days to, to high yields, not terribly uh, badly, depending where you look. Longer duration, um, maybe uh, uh, not as good as shorter duration equities. Crude right now up about a third of 1%. 96.52 is the uh, number for NYMEX crude. So a little bit of a bounce back, but very small. And Bitcoin also um, uh, down, but only nine tenths of 1%, 43,505. There are not a lot of huge moves in today's uh, market, guys. So at least uh, on this side of the Atlantic, it looks like we're still kind of waiting for something or, or trying to digest the Fed minutes that we got yesterday. Absolutely. I think the move came post Brainard, Leo Brainard, obviously front running the Fed minutes. Uh, so maybe less of a reaction. The market maybe a little bit more attuned uh, to what we were going to get. European equities generally well bid today, but they're coming back only a little bit. London is underperforming. The reason for that, the mining stocks uh, and the oil stocks are actually down. Names like Glencore and Shell. I'll show you Shell uh, in just a moment. But broadly elsewhere, actually uh, some fairly decent pictures emerging. Let's talk about some of the individual assets that we want to be focusing on and get some details there. Uh, so the stock 600 up by seven tenths of one percent i mentioned shell down by 1.7 percent commodities broadly are lower today but shell confirming it's going to take a five billion dollar hit as it exits from russia uh, the french 10-year pay attention to what is happening here today catching a bid but we're warming up to this weekend's elections as the polls continue to narrow the second round looks like emmanuel macron and marine le pen the market's starting to pay attention there uh, and euro dollar uh, the dollar is actually continuing to be on the front foot that is a Take away from the Fed minutes. We've now got a 108 handle uh, on euro dollar. We're waiting for ECB accounts. They come out uh, at lunchtime, Europe time. Let's have a quick check on what is happening with Russian assets. Uh, we've been focusing on what's been happening with the ruble over the last few days. Dollar ruble now at 79. Remember, it was up at 140. We've completely round tripped. Is that a real market? The concern here ultimately is that as Europe continues to buy gas from Russia, it continues to support the economy and continues to support the currency. U.S. officials certainly paying a great deal of attention to that one, Kaylee. Absolutely, Guy, and we're going to have more on that story in just a minute. First, though, I do want to mention some breaking news out of the auto sector. Mercedes-Benz in the first quarter saw car unit sales down 50 
15% from January to March. That was due to challenging market conditions, mainly due to semiconductor bottlenecks. Of course, this is a story we've been hearing for some time. On the better news, though, Mercedes-Benz EV sales in particular tripled. So that is looking, uh, the electric strategy is looking like the real growth driver going forward. Now, let's look ahead to what else is coming up today. As Guy mentioned, the ECB will publish its account of its March policy meeting at 7.30 a.m. New York time. Also, the United Nations General Assembly is set to vote on whether to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council. That is a move that the United States in particular has been pushing for. Then Fed speak will continue. Can we even get any more hawkish? James Bullard, Raphael Bostic, and Charles Evans all will be speaking throughout the day. Also speaking today, Peter Thiel, Kathy Wood, and Michael Saylor, they're all set to speak at the mm. Bitcoin conference, B conference in Miami. And finally, Matt, this one's for you. The Masters Golf Tournament kicks off in Augusta, Georgia with a green jacket and $11.5 million on the line. And as of right now, Tiger Woods will be playing, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. I know what I'll be doing this weekend for sure. Um, and it won't be paying attention to the Fed. But there has been a lot of Fed going on, and there's a lot more to come. Fed officials have laid out a roadmap for reducing the assets they bought during the pandemic. They plan to shrink their balance sheet by more than a trillion dollars a year at the top end. That's according to the minutes of their meeting in March. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us with more. Danny? Uh, Matt, I think I put it really well when you said that Brainard front run a lot of this meeting's notes. No real hawkish surprise. Of course, we did get more details. Details always important. That max cap of $95 billion of uh, selling, unwinding of the balance sheet a month. So what, in terms of a market reaction, it wasn't one of surprise. It was one of continuing trends. Let me run us through those trends. One was of a strengthening greenback, dollar flirting with its highest since 2017. Rather, The other one we've been witnessing is this rise in mortgage bond yields. 30-year yield, the benchmark of Fannie Mae paper. I have a chart for that for our radio listening audience. That one has also been spiking up higher. Now it's the highest in about a decade, save for the period in 2018 when we first got QT, the upset in the market that caused the Fed to back off. Now, one of the final ones we also saw in reaction yesterday was this rise in real yields. 10-year real yield just 20 basis points away at one point from hitting a positive level. Now, with those real yields coming up, you also duly uh, saw equity markets react to a bit of a sell-off, especially in the longer duration tech stocks. Now the question is, how much damage will the Fed allow? Of course, if you're Bill Dudley, you think wealth destruction is a feature, not a bug of monetary policy. And Guy, of course, I should mention, within the shadow of all of this, we also get ECB minutes out later today. Absolutely. They get very upset when you call them minutes. You have to call them accounts. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> they have to differentiate themselves from the Fed. Danny, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Danny Berger on what we got from the Fed last night and what we're going to get from the ECB a little bit later on. Let's return to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, the country's foreign minister pleading for more weapons at a meeting of NATO allies in Brussels. My agenda is very simple. It has only three items on it. It's weapons, weapons and weapons. We are confident that the best way to help Ukraine now is to provide it with all necessary to contain Putin and to defeat Russian army in Ukraine, in the territory of Ukraine. Continue our global coverage of what is happening in Ukraine with Maria Tadeo, our Europe correspondent. She's at the NATO headquarters uh, in Brussels. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from Washington, D.C. as well. Maria, let me start with you. The NATO Secretary General is warning that we are entering, quote, a crucial phase in this war. The Ukrainians want more weapons. How will NATO allies respond? Well, Guy, the Secretary General was very clear this morning. He says uh, Russian troops at this point, uh, they're just taking a break before a major offensive in the east of Ukraine. They're regrouping to resupply and rearm. That is, uh, That was his words earlier today. He also says that the goal here is potentially to take the entire Donbass region. Remember, this is geographically very important for Vladimir Putin. We've talked about this for weeks, this push for the Russians to create a land corridor between the Donbass, Mariupol, and then, of course, Crimea. 
Crimea. The other big thing here, of course, is that Vladimir Putin is facing the clock. Remember, there is this big parade coming up on May 9th. This is victory day for the Russians. It's the big Soviet Union defeat of Nazi Germany. Vladimir Putin needs to show his public something uh, for this war. Now, when it comes to NATO ministers, it's very clear they don't want to get involved in this. They say we are going to, however, continue to support Ukraine with weapons. But we heard also from the Ukrainian foreign minister who says that is not enough. NATO continues to make a distinction between offensive and defensive. He says at this point, all of Ukraine is defending itself and therefore needs heavy weapons, all kinds of weapons. And by the way, guys, just as some color, outside of NATO today, there was a protest of Ukrainians who were fighting and, well, again, screaming on a megaphone saying fighter jets for Ukraine, fighter mm. jets for Ukraine. So that gives you a sense of the mood here in this meeting. All right, Maria, thanks very much, Maria. Today, there at the NATO headquarters in Brussels. Now, in Washington, President Biden says U.S. sanctions are crushing Russia's economy. Just in one year, our sanctions are likely to wipe out the last 15 years of Russia's economic gains. And because we've cut Russia off from importing technologies like semiconductors and encryption security and critical components of quantum technology that they need to compete in the 21st century, we're going to stifle Russia's ability and its economy to grow for years to come. Let's get to Jack, Jack Fitzpatrick. He is in Washington, D.C. to talk about what the U.S. Um, wants to do in terms of sanctions and, and how the U.S. can influence also those who are helping Russia. Um, at least India, for example, continues to buy uh, oil from Russia. Yeah, obviously, there's been a lot of focus on uh, President Biden's conversations with European allies trying to have a, a unified front on sanctions there. Uh, but there has been a little bit more pressure on India lately. Uh, just uh, yesterday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said it had been communicated to India uh, that it would be a bad idea for them to have any more of a formal uh, relationship and accelerate uh, purchases of Russian commodities. Worth keeping in mind also that in addition to energy commodities, Russia is, uh, or rather India is the rather, is the largest purchaser of Russian weapons. Uh, so any tensions with China or Pakistan actually sort of indirectly plays into that dynamic that ties them economically to Russia as well. Well, Jack, of course, the U.S. hasn't just warned India about helping Russia. It's warned China as well. And that relationship maybe could get just a little bit more testy after news uh, reports overnight that Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, is going to visit Taiwan this weekend. How significant is that? That would be very significant. Uh, the Speaker's office has not confirmed that. They play these uh, congressional delegations very close to the chest. Uh, but the reporting from the Fuji News Network is that she plans to go there this weekend and would arrive uh, on Sunday. This would be the first time a Speaker has visited Taiwan since Newt Gingrich in 1997. It has already gotten uh, a, a bit of pushback from China. A spokesman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry said there would be consequences. They would take strong measures that they haven't detailed, uh, but take strong measures against the U.S. So clearly it's a, uh, it would be a major sign toward Taiwan and something that is not being taken lightly by China either. All right, Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government down in Washington, D.C. for us this morning. Thank you so much. So that's what's going on in political news. Let's talk about corporate news now. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has taken a stake in laptop maker HP valued at more than $4.2 billion. Now, Berkshire has traditionally stayed away from some of those technology investments, but it has moved into that sector in recent years. It now owns about 121 million shares of HP. As a result, that stock getting a huge lift in pre-market trading, up about 11.7% before the bell. Another stock moving to the upside is Roblox, the video game company. It was rate, uh, initiated with a buy over at City, $59 price target. The stock trading at $46.40 right now, up a little more than 1% in early hours. To the downside, though, SoFi is moving lower. This, of course, is a lending company. Part of its business is refinancing student loans. It had to cut its forecast because of the Biden administration's move to pause student loan payments for even further out into this year. That stock is down about 5.5% in early hours as a result. Kelly, we were mentioning uh, the ECB, but just a moment ago, we have news from Frankfurt, from the ECB. Uh, President Lagarde has COVID. Now, she's saying at the moment, or at least the ECB is saying at the moment, that the symptoms are, quote, reasonably mild and will have no impact on ECB operations. The ECB is now in a quiet period ahead of its meeting next Thursday. Uh, the Governing Council meeting is in person. The press conference is virtual. So one would have to assume that Christine Lagarde will not be 
at that governing council meeting and it comes at an interesting time uh, as obviously we have a growing number of hawks increasingly worried about the inflation data that is coming out of the eurozone talking of inflation data talking of the fight against inflation we'll be referencing that next Stephen Blitz chief US economist at TS Lombard will be joining us uh, to focus on the Fed minutes uh, we're going to speak to an expert in multilateral sanctions uh, Dr Clara Portella from the University of Valencia is going to be joining us plus the return of the Bloomberg Wealth Summit. Highlights include Aries Management, uh, Michael Araghetti, New York Stock Exchange Group President Lynn Martin. It all starts today at 9 a.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lyons. Guy Johnson is in London. London. Anna Edwards is off this week. I'm looking at something that uh, happened yesterday, but um, after my bedtime, I guess, around 6 a.m. Bill Dudley um, calling for the Fed to force equity corrections or um, really re reduce or destroy wealth as if it's a feature, not a bug of Fed policy. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and this chart that I'm showing for those of you listening on radio is U.S. financial conditions. Obviously, we've tightened a bit, but we haven't seen a huge drop in um, equity uh, levels, S&P uh, index um, in the bottom panel here. Tatiana Dari of Bloomberg MLive joins us right now. And Tatiana, I wonder how people react to this because I just think it's pretty shocking to hear, although it makes sense logically that that would happen since we created wealth on the upside. Yes, exactly, Matt. Uh, as you said there, Bill Dudley coming out with that open piece saying that stocks and bonds will have to suffer more. And as you pointed on that chart, uh, we haven't tightened that much. And actually, if you zoom into 2022, you'll see there's a green bar for the month of March. And that's because stocks have rallied and that has filtered through to other asset classes like credit and junk bonds uh, in particular. So the Fed needs to tighten a lot more. And if the tightening, uh, according to the latest minutes, and if the tightening doesn't happen, on its own, as Bill Dudley said, then the Fed will have to shock markets uh, here by sending stocks uh, and bonds lower. Tatiana, when I talk to equity investors, the thing they talk about is what's happening with real yields. Real yields have really benefited stocks because they've been negative for quite some time. They're starting to creep out back up to zero. My question to you is, do we need to get to zero for stock markets to react or do we need to go north of zero for stock markets to react? I think we're seeing some reaction in stocks already yesterday, a big sell off there. But uh, today we're seeing stocks in defensive mode. And uh, obviously, as though uh, those yields are rising and if we hit uh, positive territory, then all of a sudden they look good. And all of a sudden there is somewhat of an alternative to stocks. So then the relative value of stocks becomes a little less attractive, especially for the highly priced technology shares. And we've seen tech uh, leading the the sell-off here this week. But, of course, uh, we'll see where it goes as uh, traders are still in pricing discovery mode. Tatiana, in the last few days, we've seen the yield curve here in the U.S. steepen back out. Once again, the 10-year Treasury about 13 basis points above that of the two-year. Is there any sign that that's sustainable or is reversion to inversion more likely? Uh, well, it depends on, uh, again, you know, on those Fed expectations and, and where inflation goes from here. But uh, for those that are concerned that yield curves uh, signal a chance of recession, uh, we have looked at what this does to the stock market and actually showed that stocks have largely posted uh, more gains than losses uh, when yield curves inverted. But uh, I have to say, looking at uh, how it's been performing, you know, it's not unusual for the curve to invert again after a few uh, brief positive sessions. Tatiana, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Tatiana Dari of Bloomberg M Live, Market Live. Thank you very much indeed. And for more of that excellent market analysis, all you've got to do, go to your terminal, MLIV Go, on the Bloomberg. You'll find what you're looking at here on the screen, some excellent analysis. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Guy Johnson in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In Ukraine's port city of Mariupol, the mayor says that Russian attacks have killed more than 5,000 civilians. He also says that more than 90% of the city's infrastructure has been destroyed. If Russia captures Mariupol, it would open a land corridor to the Crimean Peninsula, which of course Moscow seized from Ukraine in 2014. The next economic jolt to Russia will probably come in the labor market. According to a Bloomberg survey of analysts, unemployment there this year is set to more than double, exceeding 9% for the first time in more than a decade. Sanctions have put pressure on the Russian economy and are having it on course for one of the deepest recessions in Russia's modern history. And a copy of the first ever tweet by Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey has been offered for almost $48 million on non-fungible token marketplace OpenSea. That's 16 times what the owner paid for it a year ago. The owner is the CEO of a Malaysian blockchain company. He's offered to give 50% of the proceeds from the sale to charity. Coming up, we'll get away from NFTs and back to the markets and back to the U.S. economy and get reaction to the Federal Reserve Minutes from Stephen Blitz, chief U.S. economist at TS Lombard. Have we reached peacockishness? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and here's what you need to know. The Fed Minute signal an aggressive unwind of its $9 trillion balance sheet and point to a half-point hike at next month's meeting. Ukraine is pleading for NATO to send more weapons ahead of an expected Russian offensive. It's also accusing Germany of dragging its feet. And Warren Buffett certainly has his appetite back. Berkshire Hathaway confirming overnight that it's bought a $4.2 billion stake in HP. The laptop and printer maker's stock is up sharply pre-market. So I'm Guy Johnson in London. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines are both over in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. Matt, what's going on pre-market? Uh, you know, there's not a heck of a lot going on. I think you said it really well at the top of the program that Lyle Brainerd really was front running um, the Fed minutes. And we got our reaction yesterday and, and actually the day before in the drops that we saw. We do see futures up now, almost two tenths of 1%, but not a huge move to the upside. And investors are buying bonds as well. That pushes the yield down to two spot. 5715. Um, NYMEX crude up about 1%, a little bit more right now. So recovering from the drops that we've seen, the big drops that we've seen over the last couple of sessions. 97.39 is a level there, holding under 100. And Bitcoin holds under 45,000. Even as this big conference goes on with the amazing new bull unveiled yesterday in Miami, Bitcoin down one and a quarter percent to 43,300. 37. Kaylee, what are you seeing in terms of pre-market movers? Well, the one big story we are watching is HP. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway taking a $4.2 billion stake in the company, equivalent to about 121 million shares. Kind of an unusual move for a Berkshire that usually has stayed away from technology, but is increasingly dipping its toe into it. And HP is reaping the reward of that. That stock up about 13% in early hours. Something else I noticed in the pre-market trade that I thought was kind of interesting is you're seeing a lift really across the board for EV makers in particular. Of course, this group of stocks has been weighed down a bit by supply chain challenges, fears around sanctions uh, put on Russia, making that potentially worse. But they're getting uh, a nice reprieve today. You have Rivian, Lucid and Tesla all up between 1.4, 1.7% in early hours this morning, Guy. Kelly, here in Europe, stocks are definitely big. You've got them up by around six tenths of 1%. I don't think it's that big a move, though. We have seen a few down days. This doesn't feel that convincing, but we are trading higher. Commodity stocks, though, are lower. It's the metal stocks, it's the mining stocks, it's also the oil stocks, names like Shell and BP. Shell confirming that it is going to take a circa $5 billion hit as it exits Russia. That's certainly what it's flagging. Uh, keep an eye on what's happening with European bonds. They are bid today, so yields are coming lower, but they have been shooting higher over the last few days. In particular, keep an eye on the OAT, the French 10-year. This is we track towards this weekend's election, first round. Got to keep an eye on that one. Marine Le Pen, Emmanuel Macron really getting close in terms of their polling numbers. Uh, and the dollar just goes from strength to strength right now. We've now got euro dollar trading at 108.78, uh, below 109. We've moved progressively down over the last few days. That's going to be a problem for the ECB as we watch what is happening here uh, in terms of the imported inflation story. They're going to keep an eye on that. Now, it's not going to have a big impact in terms of trade, but it is another factor in terms of that inflation narrative as energy shoots through the roof. Talking of what is happening there with the energy story, let's focus on what is happening with Russia, particularly what's happening with the ruble, which is now completely 
completely round tripped. Got up to around 140 as the uh, initial invasion impact was felt, but it's completely come back down again. Is that a free floating currency? Maybe not, but we're trading 79 right now. The optics are that Russia is weathering that. And that's something you want to pay attention to as well. Keep an eye on the 10-year bond. Clearly, the message coming out of Washington from the Treasury is they are pushing for a default by Russia, Kaylee. And that's certainly what we're watching. And, and the Russians are going to be continuing to push back on this narrative. Absolutely. And they are doing so right now. We're hearing from uh, Dmitry. Dmitry Peskov, who, of course, is the Kremlin spokesman, he's speaking on a conference call. He says that Russia will respond to the latest round of U.S. sanctions, that Russia is continuing work in the G20 mulling summit plans. And this is interesting because, of course, that G20 happening a few months from now in Bali. It's been a question mark whether or not Vladimir Putin will attend and what that means for participation from the likes of the U.S. The Kremlin also saying that U.S. arms supplies to Kyiv are a negative for peace talks. This, of course, as Ukraine continues to calls, uh, call for more weapons from NATO. And Dmitry Peskov also saying that Vladimir Putin will hold his regular Security Council meeting uh, today, Thursday. So we'll continue to monitor those headlines. Meanwhile, on the economic front, the Fed signaling its most aggressive effort in decades to curb inflation. Officials will begin selling off that $9 trillion asset portfolio, starting to run off that balance sheet, and may raise rates a half percentage point next month. Joining us now is Steve Stephen Blitz, chief U.S. economist at T.S. Lombard. Stephen, is this as hawkish as the Fed can get? Well, no. Uh, I think, in fact, it really depends upon how you view the coming quarter, the quarter that we're in, because this will really sort of tell the tale of the tape. There's a lot of reasons to expect this economy to slow down in the current quarter. It's going to be 1.5% growth in Q1 and may probably another 1.5% in Q2. So does a growth scare come through, right? So the way to think of it is that the Fed, you know, they said they want to get to neutral. Well, as rapidly as possible. Well, neutral can come to them by the Fed, come, by the economy, by the economy coming down. But if the economy does not slow enough uh, in the coming quarter, uh, then they're going to be chasing. And they're going to be chasing for another probably 18 months or so. And rates will get a lot higher than uh, the market is uh, currently anticipating. So it's a really the economy is going to determine it, um, and they're just going to follow. Steve, uh, we had a survey. Our M Live blog um, asked 525 participants if they thought a recession was going to come this year, next year, 2023 or 2024. About half of the respondents said in 2023 is when we're going to get a recession. And in fact, Roberto Perley um, from Piper Sandler the other day was. Uh, showing what happens whenever the Fed raises rates to neutral or through, um, you know, his idea of what his estimate of what neutral rates um, were. We see a recession. Do you expect one? Well, I always expect a recession at some point. Right. And if the same one's going to happen in 23 or 24, I'm not sure what you really what anyone's really saying. I think the important thing for the markets, I think, to understand is that either the economy really slows down enough to take this pressure off the Fed and pressure off of prices near term. And if that fails to happen, uh, if I look back to, say, the late 70s, and I don't expect inflation rates to get anywhere close to that, but it turns out to be very stubborn. And the Fed has to get real aggressive on getting real rates higher. And to date, they're not doing that. And I mean, you know, you can still borrow, you know, commercial paper to finance inventory at less than the rate of inflation, at less than nominal GDP growth. And as long as you can do that, you're not going to force an, infl a, uh, an inventory change. Uh, and the same is true on the on the 10 year, as long as you have negative real yields. If you go back to 2018, real yields had to get up at the 10 year had to get up to about 100 basis points, over 100 basis points before you really started to see the slowdown in the equity market and it caused the well, Fed to reverse. We're and, a long way from there. So, and inflation, of course, getting inflation under control is the main goal of all of this. Yesterday, Bill Dudley said the Fed needs to inflict more losses on investors, um, as if that's almost part of the program, a feature, not a bug, as people have been saying um, today. Do you agree? Well, yeah, because what he's not telling you is that we've since 2008, we've lived in an asset cycle, not a credit cycle. So the idea of, of just sort of saying, well, you know, Fed's got rates raised, it's too expensive to borrow and all that. And that's true, obviously, in the housing market. But broadly speaking, it's not a leveraged economy. 
So there's two avenues where the Fed can really hurt growth. One at the short end has to do with the dollar, has to do with short-term financing. At the, at the long end, it has to do with the equity market. And if you don't crack the equity market, you're not going to uh, get a slowdown in growth. And, uh, you know, if, at these levels of yields, yep. that, in fact, is why the equity market is, is kind of hanging in here right now, because it's looking at what the Fed's doing. It's looking at these balance sheet changes. And to be honest, yep. it's not particularly aggressive. Steve, let's talk a little bit about the inflation trajectory here. Mechanically, inflation probably is going to fall in the latter part of this year. My question to you is, what does it come down to? I don't think many people expect it to come back down to target, i.e. 2%. But where do you think it settles? Well, I, I've been saying actually long before this that the, a 2.5%, 3% inflation rate is probably the right number for this cycle. And I think that if they can get this number under 3%, they'll declare victory. And I, and I actually expect, as the inflation rate starts to fall off, even in the second quarter, in the beginning of the third quarter, that at Jackson Hole, he's going to talk about a 2.5% of the 2% cycle, which is another way of saying the Fed is not going to tighten to the extent that they want to drive inflation back to 2%. If it gets under 3 and it's stable under 3, they'll, they'll declare victory and go home. <laughs> Declare victory and go home, if only. Stephen, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Stephen Blitz, Chief US Economist at TS Lombard. Coming up, we're going to speak to an expert in multilateral sanctions. Dr. Clara Portella uh, from the University of Valencia is going to be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Europe European Commission Executive Vice President Margaret Versteyer. That's at 2.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Ukraine is fighting a defensive war. We need both the, uh, the, the support with weapons, but also to step up sanctions, and therefore I also welcome the fact that NATO allies are now in the process of, uh, of stepping up further sanctions uh, on uh, Russia. That was, of course, the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, speaking earlier at the NATO meeting, which is taking place in Brussels. Talking about weapons, at the moment the West is largely using sanctions as the primary weapon, the primary tool to try and deter Vladimir Putin from further action in Ukraine. Are those sanctions working? Ultimately, are we heading along a spectrum here where ultimately we are going to have to deal with military options? Let's talk to a sanctions expert about where we are uh, on that continuum. Clara Portella, political science lecturer at the University of Valencia, joining us now. Clara, the debate is starting about what comes next. Where are we in terms of the effectiveness of the sanctions that have been applied thus far? Sanctions take time to work. Are the sanctions that have been used thus far working? Well, in, in order to answer this question, we first need to establish what is it that we expect sanctions to accomplish. So if the intention is to mitigate the conflict or to put an end to the uh, military operations in Ukraine, the answer is that they are not working and they are not likely to work anytime soon. But uh, at the same time, there might be other objectives that the sanctions are pursuing. And one of them uh, seems to be uh, to provide a disincentive for the elites that support the current uh, leadership in Russia to continue providing that support. So if the intention is to severe uh, this uh, link, this um, uh, support that the elites are, given, are giving to the current leadership, then we might actually be witnessing some, uh, um, some successes in the sense that uh, step by step, gradually, these elites might be withdrawing the support that is necessary for the permanence in power of the leadership and for the continuation of the military operations in Ukraine. 
Okay, well, of course, the one sanctions we haven't seen yet are on Russian gas from Europe, because Europe is heavily reliant on that from an economic standpoint. But Russia heavily reliant on that as a revenue source as well. Could it actually make a difference militarily in terms of the funding of this massive war effort on the part of Russia? Certainly, it, the, it can make a difference. The only difficulty here is that uh, the effect will not be felt uh, overnight. Mm. So um, even if all um, exports uh, um, uh, would be uh, stopped uh, overnight, uh, this would not have a necessarily an immediate effect on uh, military operations. So the problem here is one of the mismatch between the tool that is being employed and the uh, sort of action that is um, um, well, that uh, that is being addressed. Mm. Uh, sanctions are a slow tool. A military action is very fast. I mean, you, you also have to ask yourself: Is it morally tenable? Um, even if it's going to take time, right? How can Berlin justify sending billions of dollars to Moscow if Vladimir Putin turns around and allegedly commits war crimes in Ukraine? I mean. They should have been asking themselves this since Crimea or possibly before. But now it's especially clear um, that what they're doing is going to put them on the wrong side of history once again. Well, uh, I think that the moral case uh, has already been clearly established. So there would be a lot of support uh, from the entire political spectrum in order to stop uh, that uh, uh, energy link. But the problem is that uh, energy uh, links cannot be severed or uh, energy dependence cannot be reversed uh, from one day to the next. So this is a process that takes time. Uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the big question is how the uh, economy uh, can uh, continue to cover its energy needs uh, if the... Um, uh, well, if uh, energy supplies stop overnight or uh, if suddenly energy prices go up spectacularly from one yep. day to the next. I mean, actually, in Spain, we are having a, a pretty difficult situation at the moment because energy prices have been going up over the past few months. And this has nothing to do with, um, with um, a crisis. But, I mean, there has already been a strike going on. So yep. popular discons discontent... Uh, um, a big industry discontent uh, is um, guaranteed if uh, we experience any um, abrupt change in terms of energy prices. Sanctions do have an impact domestically. And I, I, the first thing you learn, I remember Sanctions 101 being told that, that they are often more applied to serving a domestic purpose rather than a foreign policy purpose. Is there, a, is there an element of what is happening here in Europe that they know, the political leaders, that things are going to get worse in Ukraine? And if you roll out the sanctions kind of all at once, you, you leave nothing left. And what is left potentially could be military options. So you roll them out more slowly to serve that domestic narrative, that domestic uh, desire to see something done. But if you, if you do it all at once, you don't have that. Certainly, there is an element of strategizing when it comes to the rolling out of sanctions. And the idea is to go step by step uh, for several reasons. One of them is that you want to give some space for the um, uh, interlocutor or for the um, uh, target of sanctions to, um, well, to uh, mitigate uh, or to change um, policies. If you do not leave uh, that space, they, uh, the uh, targets lack any incentive to actually change strategy. If everything is lost for them from a, a moment zero, then a, what, what incentive, what reason would they have to try to accommodate the demands of the sender? And it is true that part of the, of the reason why sanctions are imposed is because the domestic audience wants to see some uh, reaction but uh, the domestic audience is not the only uh, target or the only addressee of the sanctions. Another audience is uh, the well, is Ukraine, the leadership in Ukraine, and the population in, U uh, in Ukraine, uh, which wants to see some support uh, from the um, uh, the EU 
another target are the elites in Russia that um, are receiving the message that they have to stop support for the current leadership because the current leadership is not going to be able to guarantee their prosperity long yep. term. <laughs> Clara, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for your time and your analysis. Clara Portella, political science lecturer at the University of Valencia. Thank you very much. Now, coming up on Balance of Power a little bit later on, the former UK Foreign Secretary, David Miliband. That conversation, 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. here in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition, not to be confused with Bloomberg Surveillance, the OG. We have the creator in our midst here, Guy and Kaylee. Tom Keene joins us yeah. with, uh, what, you've got your single best chart you're going to share with us and then tell us about your guest. Yeah, when I started the show, I tried to get Tyler, the creator, to do the music and that didn't work out. <laughs> Let's go to the chart right now. Uh, this is inflation, folks, and it's not runaway, but it's getting there. The reason I know is my car coming in today, the Bentley mat is still in the garage. My Uber ride went up $12, $12 in one day, and that's got to be gasoline. That's got to be the inflation we're all living. This is the five-year, five-year four. This is what Tony Cosenzi of PIMCO pays attention to, and all you need to know, we're getting back near the 3% level when we look out five years and then the guesstimate of inflation five years from there. We're getting back up near 3%. Tom, you and I were joking in the break how good the French are now at rugby, which is annoying me a lot, but the focus firmly on politics now when it comes to France. Uh, Olivier Blanchard is a professor. He's a professor of economics. He's also French. You've got him on the show a little bit later on. What are you guys going to talk about? He's the French giant, and what's so important there, Guy, is back when you and I are on the River Seine watching Mr. Macron be anointed, uh, it's real simple. Olivier Blanchard and Adam Posen were talking about a need for a higher inflation. And the key question with Professor Blanchard is from these levels we're at now, do we come back down to a Blanchard posing level of inflation, or are we supposed to dream of getting back to 2%? All right, Tom Keene, the OG, the creator, anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Now, other than watching Tom Keene and John and Lisa in a few minutes, here's what else we're watching today. I will be paying attention to, yes, more Fed speak. First, you have Jim Buller speaking at 9 a.m., the St. Louis Fed president, probably the most hawkish of them all. Then at 2 p.m., you have Atlanta Fed president Raphael Bostic and Chicago Fed president Charles Evans. What can they say, Matt, that the market doesn't already know? We know about the rapid unwind of the balance sheet, and we know about a 50 basis point move in May. Yeah, I mean, I suppose they'll probably be giving us more detail, and it'll be especially interesting to hear that from Bullard the Hawk. I'm watching the Bitcoin bull unveiled yesterday in Miami. The conference continues, Bitcoin 2022. It's really one of um, the main events for crypto investors. And Kaylee, uh, you and I have a show that focuses on crypto every Tuesday at one, but of course we pay attention the rest of the week as well. Really Indeed. interesting amidst this conference to see the price fall down back below $45,000. Um, so we'll be paying uh, special attention to what we hear today. Something physical at a Bitcoin conference. <laughs> Shouldn't it be virtual? Anyway, a virtual I joke. Uh, Boris, Johnson's gonna, Boris Johnson is going to meet President Duda of Poland today uh, in London. He's going to meet Olaf Scholz tomorrow. You want to pay attention to that. Hawks and doves. It's going to be a fascinating conversation between all of those. Uh, early edition is done. Tom, John and Lisa are up next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.